Thank you all for joining another conversation with the MCF Book Club, Reading for a Liberated Future. My name is Dr. Carmen Rojas, and I'm the president and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation. Today, I'll be in conversation with Miriam Kaba and Kelly Hayes, the co-editors of Let This Radicalize You, Organizing and the Revolution of Reciprocal Care. We'll also be joined by Tony Michelle Williams, the executive director of Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative, and Asha Edwards, a college student and community organizer in Chicago. Let This Radicalize You is a resource for activists and organizers working to build power in an era of great destabilization. The book is intended to support communities as they map their own journeys through the work of justice making. Before we begin, I would like to thank our wonderful co-sponsor, Seattle Arts and Lectures. Seattle Arts and Lectures is committed to engaging and inspiring readers and writers of all generations in the greater Puget Sound region. I also want to share a little bit about Marguerite Casey Foundation. Marguerite Casey Foundation is working towards a country where our government prioritizes the needs of excluded and underrepresented people. In order to achieve that vision, we support organizations, scholars, leaders, and initiatives focused on shifting the balance of power in society, building power for communities who continue to be excluded from shaping how society works and from sharing in its rewards and freedoms. We are so proud to support authors like Miriam and Kelly by purchasing and sharing their work with our beloved community. MCF is committed to providing over a thousand free copies of their book to a mix of registered guests and community-based organizations. And we are thrilled that those joining today can access its vital messages as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. I wanna to start with a question to Miriam. One of the themes that I kept returning to was the idea of organizing as an antidote to despair. I'd love to hear you elaborate on this idea. Sure. Um, thank you for having us um, today, inviting us to be in conversation around this book that um, Kelly and I wrote together. Um, and I want to say um, the organizing as the antidote to despair is something that um, Harsha Walia at the end of the book um, in the afterword kind of summarizing three themes that she took from the book. She mentioned the concept of organizing as an antidote or the antidote to despair. I would think I would say um, for me, it can be an antidote to despair in the sense that I think at least, um, I think that taking positive collective action can crowd out a despairing mood um, because it offers kind of a little bit of light and helps you to perceive yourself and your community more clearly. Um, I see organizing, at least for myself in my experience, it's been a form of continuing education and also a laboratory for experimenting. Um, organizing also breaks isolation and can frankly also break your heart. But one of the things that you learn while organizing is that you won't be alone in that grief that comes with a broken heart, that others will be there um, to offer solace and support. Um, and I like the way that, um, you know, thinking about organizing as collectivity towards survival lets you think about how you can bring your own small rocks um, you know, towards that larger collective struggle. And those small rocks make a difference. They make a difference to you as the person who brought them there. And they make a difference to the others who see you bringing the rocks also together. So I really feel that connecting with others is really essential in general. And it's really important for us in this time for us, not, no one person has the answer to anything. So we've got to collectivize our ideas, collectivize our efforts and collectivize care. And all those things happen while you're organizing. And so it can be an antidote to despair in all of those different kinds of ways. So that's how I, yeah, that's how I think about it. I love this, um, uh, the visual in my mind of uh, what happens when people are in grief after having their heart broken and 
Uh, I feel like we all know the story about what that happened, like, and can imagine what that's what, what it feels like to go through something like that on your own and then instead to have a different practice of coming together and of coming together to heal, but also of coming together to chart a different path forward, like to uh, press on the edges of what abundant love for each other looks like, right? Um, thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, I'm going to transition to you, Kelly. You explore the practice of mutual aid in a beautiful and nuanced way in this book. And, you know, mutual aid during the pandemic was something that I think many people were talking about. It would be helpful uh, if you can share an example of mutual aid that you're inspired by and why a focus on mutual aid is important in this moment. Well, I th there are so many mutual aid projects that inspire me all the time. Um, I'm surrounded, I'm very grateful to be surrounded in my life by projects that people are creating and recreating all the time to keep each other safe, um, to provide for folks who are in need. Um, a lot of what my collective, uh, the Lifted Voices Collective has done during these pandemic years has been about making sure that organizers are not getting evicted, that they have food in their fridge, that organizations that go through bumps in the road where it's like this month they don't have the money to continue their mutual aid project, but next month they would, making sure that that doesn't derail their work. And so I am I am constantly uh, being reminded that this is actually how we keep our communities afloat and these these systems and these ways of living together are very much embedded in many of our communities like all the time uh, but i would say that the way these things kind of emerged um, during the pandemic in those early days was a time of great inspiration for me while we were all grappling with so much grief and sadness and fear of like not knowing what was going to happen to us or our larger communities, particularly the more vulnerable folks in our lives. Um, I was really reminded that, you know, we are the hope. Like we are the hope that has the potential to sustain a future that we want to live in. And I don't think it's any coincidence that we saw the massive support that we did for people who were taking rebellious action in the streets and that those and that that support was coinciding with people witnessing and experiencing and, and participating in these mass acts of mutual care um, because there is something about mutual aid that shifts social dynamics it shifts our sense of what's possible um, and our sense of what should be because uh, you had a lot of folks who very abruptly experienced what I would say probably most of people's in this country's kind of first taste of collapse, the sense that the bottom can fall out and the world that you knew could be over. It could just be done and the systems that you're used to relying upon, they can just crumble on you in, in these, these really crucial moments. And in that moment of people feeling abandoned and not knowing what was going to happen, um, folks saw one of the largest mobilizations of mutual aid in U.S. history, sort of aided by um, our ability to connect digitally. Um, we saw things spring up so fast all over the country. And I think that, you again, you can't separate that. You cannot separate that from the fact that people were willing to back people in the streets doing rebellious things that they would not have probably supported just a couple months before. Um, the, their sense of what the system was in relation to themselves had been upended. They began to experience what it means for people to be more invested in each other than they are in a system and what kind of power we have under those conditions. And that's something I think about all the time in relation to mutual aid is that, you know, when people are more invested in each other than they are in authority, then those people are in a position to set terms. And we had a massive number of people having that kind of psychological experience. And while not all of those projects have endured over time and not everything in the streets came to, you know, all of the results that some folks would have liked, um, I, Dean Spade said something a while back that really 
hit me in a good way, which was that um, a lot of those projects, those projects ended when normalcy or some, you know, some shade of it was restored, or for whatever reason, a lot of these projects didn't continue, and maybe some of the protests didn't yield what people wanted. It still matters so much that people had those experiences. They, they got out there and they had those experiences of mutual care and mutual assistance and showing up for each other and supporting something that was so far beyond the scope of what they would have been used to supporting. And these things do change us and they change our sense of what's possible and they open up our eyes to what human potential can really be. And so that's what mutual aid means to me. Mm, I love that you um, make this necessary connection between uh, caring for each other and rebellion, right? Like there's this really I think we often think about mutual aid as one practice and organizing as another practice. And the thing that I kept coming book, back to as I read the book was a tapestry of practices of loving each other in new ways. And part of that tapestry being mutual aid, part of that tapestry being organizing. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, I'm going to turn to you, Tony Michelle. It's so wonderful to see you and be with you. Good to see you again as well. It's been about a year. I'm really happy to be here and honored to be with some of the greats um, and such beautiful organizers and writers. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Mir Miriam and Kelly write that we have to draw people into formation and build and through that work, the generation of new visions born in collectivity become possible. What does this look like in the organizing work that you do? Absolutely. Um, I, I love the statement around new visions. Um, when people lose so much, like we have in the last three years, uh, it takes practice, it takes skill to be able to imagine or reimagine new things, a new way of being in your heart, in connection with people, in your work, and organizing is no different. Uh, for the Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative, AKA SNAPCO, we are a black transgender and queer led organization in Atlanta, really dedicated to building safety um, in our communities. And a big part of that work has been, again, the practice of reimagining what that looks like. For trans people across the country, um, black women and femme folks across the country um, and other women of color, we are under attack. This year alone, there were over 300 um, anti-trans and LGBTQ uh, bills and pieces of legislation that were introduced um, to literally block our progress from existing as free and as with as much autonomy as we could have. And autonomy is care, it's self-care, it's self-love. And trans folks in the last years, the, the more visible that we've been um, in the media and in our organizing, um, the more that we've seen um, um, just people being more creative and present with themselves, it ushered a new renaissance. Shout out to Beyonce. Okay, um, and so which is a dedication to Black queerness and transness, um, and it's a magic of how people see and witness themselves. And so um, we are in the reimagining of safety in our communities. Um, and how we get safe, how we keep each other safe, um, and doing that through um, digital organizing, um, through media and visual illustrations and the performing arts um, is a way that is um, is really consistent. You know, survival is sexy, but it's not sustainable. And the hustle and the grind and the money, the power, respect. You know, I love a good little rap and hip hop um, reference. So I've always thrown that in there for us, but um, but all of that is sexy for people. But um, the, the struggle has been supporting folks, Black folks and reimagining how we keep each other safe without police. Um, how do we reimagine our relationships without punishment um, and more forgiveness and more grace, patience and kindness? Asha, I'd love to bring you into this conversation. Uh, we just 
uh, spent a couple of days in Chicago, and there has been this massive shift, a political opening uh, in Chicago. And I, I think a number of people, uh, including myself, are looking at Chicago uh, in this moment. Uh, and I'm curious, one, like, how is this landing? How are, like, the political terrain landing for you and your work? And how is the power of collectivity in the formations that you are a part of? How does that manifest? Oh, what a grand question. Uh, <laughs> as I, like, just reflect on the day, like, what we're seeing is centuries in the making. What we're seeing is decades into making, there's been so many campaigns that um, fostered a path to like where we are today. And I think it's really fascinating in Chicago that um, people mobilize, like knocked on hundreds of doors to get Mayor Brandon Johnson elected. And he is our target. He is not our friend, but it's definitely going to be easier to shift material conditions um, versus like Paul Vallis. I think that's pretty extraordinary. And also uh, campaigns, especially just like looking at campaigns my mentors were a part of, I'm like, wow, they really set the stone for all of this movement building and base building. And I'm like, wow, Chicago, we're like going through like, like it feels good to win. <laughs> But um, also, uh, I think that with organizing, uh, it's definitely interesting to see like a uh, political home shift and change and transition, but uh, trying to find the root home, like what is my political home? Because sometimes you kind of age out of it as um, I have. Um, so I'm like, oh, what do I want to help with now? And I think in Chicago, there's like, Bring Chicago home, treatment, not trauma. There's the Peace Book Ordinance. There's so many different kinds of campaigns that want to bring us freedom. And I'm like, well, you got options in Chicago. Just find what you're really passionate about and really want to fight for. But Chicago, I feel like we're in a, a as Tony said, a renaissance. I don't know. This is this feels so good compared to just like all the kind of pain that you kind of saw in the last couple of years, I'm like, we're breathing, we're like slowing down. Some of us are very burnt out and in the period of just recovery. So I think that's kind of the situation. Yeah, I want to stay with you for a little bit longer, Asha, if that's okay. I'm curious. Um, I, I'm curious about like your own practices and like what brought you into the space of both dreaming and uh, believing that if in, you know, in the Chicago context, that something can be different. Like, what are the uh, the factors um, that helped you become a dreamer and a doer of the new world that we want to build and are fighting for? Yes. Well, first and foremost, I got a shout out to Sada's Daughters. Uh, when I was in high school, I joined like when I was a sophomore and then really the one that taught me about a lot of stuff I know, like abolition, the black radical tradition, how to organize and also how the city works. But uh, definitely uh, a lot of folks through Asada's Daughters and the outers communities that associate with Asada's Daughters. And also we are dissenters really truly inspired me and it really opened like another factor of like, oh, the war, the war machine, the military industrial complex, neoliberalism. So I just um, learned about, oh, this is all over the world. We got to abolish the police and um, integrate our campaign strategies. And I guess, let's see, like I would want to name a lot of indiv individual people, but that would be like a whole laundry list. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now... I really love the work of Grassroots Collaborative and the campaigns they're supporting, which is really heartwarming. So uh, I've just been helping contribute to the arts factors of that. But yeah. Thanks so much for sharing, Asha. Miriam, can I ask you the same question? Yeah. Um, I think what has gotten me to think about dreaming bigger 
Um, it's a really great question. How did I get here? I have no idea how I got here. I mean, I think I got here just in the same way that Asha did, which is other people um, who I came across who became touchstones of mine over the years. I think about teachers of mine. I think about family members. My father played a very big role in, in my life and shaping my political vision. Um, I also like read a lot and being able to turn to books of folks who inspired me to think beyond the limitations of my own imagination and kind of, you know, glom on to the imaginations they have to dream bigger has been a big thing. Um, there's a quote that I've always appreciated um, by uh, Sister Rosalie Bertel, and she always talks about that the fact that, you know, don't listen to the people who tell you not to dream big, um, that we are, we have to be part of something larger than ourselves, because our dreams are often bigger than our lifetimes are. And I really think about that a lot um, around the kind of importance of making sure that we have vision in the work we do. Um, in organizing, you can get stuck in the day-to-dayness of campaigns and specific targets and, you know, the goals of the campaign. But we're in a time now, I think, where we have to think in excess of our individual campaigns. We have to connect those together. We have to cohere across difference. We have to, you know, and you know who does that really well, frankly? The right wing. The right wing understands that they have to work simultaneously on disrupting everything. And they do that every day. And I think, you know, we on the left, on progressives and liberals need to do a better job to understand that we have to, the reason to dream big and to have vision is not just to find a way to keep moving towards that horizon, but also it gives us a more expansive terrain through which we can actually struggle together. And it lets us see beyond our very narrow silos to be like, no, actually disability justice is an integral part of our work. You know, yes, actually reproductive justice is an integral part of our work. We have to fight against these, you know, bans on gender and, uh, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, um, how do you call it, the bodily autonomy, because look at what they're doing to our trans siblings, you know, like, we have to have that vision, and we have to have that ability to dream beyond our very small lives and our small um, silos. So yeah, I think about those things that 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 really brings that to mind for me. Yeah, uh, I would regret not asking you this as a just like a quick follow up because this is a little book club. Um, tell us uh, about a book that uh, cracked something open in you. That's such a great question. The the book that door two, uh, when I was a young young person, the biography of Malcolm X really changed me. It shifted so much for me. It gave me an understanding of myself, uh, new. Um, it brought open new vistas that I hadn't yet even experienced. Um, that was a huge shift for me. The other book was a book by a man named Kamara Lai, who's from Guinea. Um, it was a book called L'Enfant Noir, um, The Dark Child, uh, which connected me to my father's um, country and his experiences and just in a different kind of way and, and allowed me to see my family um, that's on the continent in a different kind of light. Um, and then later on, as I was getting a little bit older, um, in my early 20s, I read um, Asada Shakur's um, autobiography, which also as you know, <laughs> as Asha mentioned, being part of Asada's daughters and that being transformational for her many years before that, <laughs> Asha, before you were alive, me reading that book um, was also very transformational for me, kind of got me thinking about um, carcerality in a different way, um, and kind of put me on a different path as well. So those are just a few of the trillions of books I've read <laughs> that had an impact on my I love that we get to be in this conversation because you have written a number of books uh, that have uh, cracked things open in me. And so I'm like, uh, like a fan uh, and uh, excited. And it's so the written word and the story that we carry, right? And the story that people see in us about a possible 
a future that's so different from us. I was just talking to somebody. I'm, I for the first time I'm starting to listening listen to audiobooks and uh, l just listen to Angela Davis's autobiography, the audiobook, the new release, and there's. Um, an amazing practice in that book of revisiting the opening of the book, the prologue, given the context that she's in. And I uh, f found it to be helpful, one, because you get to situate her in a different context for every, every republishing of the, of the book. But then you can see uh, how context and learning uh, and just understanding like how she learns uh, and I think books are such powerful vehicles for that. Uh, thank you so much, Miriam. Kelly, I'm gonna ask you the same question. I think I've always been a dreamer. Um, even as a child, I, I wasn't satisfied with what people told me about the world or about spirituality or how things worked. I always wanted to know why and why not and how things could be better. I was always asking questions and thinking about what could happen instead. Um, I started writing my own fiction in the sixth grade because I liked the stories in my head more than I liked the stories people were telling me. But I think I truly found my place as a dreamer and a storyteller in the work of movements because that's where I found other people who understood that we can tell stories that actually reshape the world we live in. I think understanding that everything's a story and that storytelling really is a fight for the future shapes and reshapes my life from year to year. Because as we talk about in the book, um, facts do not get people into the streets and facts do not cause people to reshape their lives in the pursuit of justice. Um, storytelling and narrative do that by making us feel things and by shaping our worldview and our sense of what's possible. So for me, I would say writing, whether it's creative or educational or movement driven, that helps me, that helps keep me in the space of creating. And my relationships, um, people like Miriam, Kim Marks, Sharon Lungo, and Lisa Fithian have always pushed me to dream bigger and to disavow cynicism and to always fight for each other. And, you know, that's basically what makes my world go round. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Tony Michelle, I'm gonna wrap this question up with you. What makes you the dreamer? This is such a great question and I've been fanning out at everyone's answer. Um, so I'm, I'm excited and nervous to answer for myself, but what keeps me dreaming? What got me to dreaming? A few things. Um, number one, just as a trans woman, um, I am just blessed with the anointing to vision myself long-term alive, well and not situated in the body that I was given. And so I'm always grateful that um, I've had the power to move through that and harness um, that kind of reimagining of myself and reimagining and reordering of my steps in connection with my family um, and with friends and, and community. And so um, uh, my right to be and my autonomy uh, to be me um, keeps me dreaming well. Um, I think inside of that, what I found is that I've had to want to be alive, okay? Um, and me wanting to be alive, me wanting to be there for the youth in my life, all of my little cousins and my babies who keep me laughing and relevant with the TikTok dances and the music that keeps me. I'm excited to dream about what's possible and more for myself and for my communities. Uh, uh, trans women, my girls, my community, uh, trans folks and gender non-binary folks, um, our resilience and, and resistance, even in cultural moments like now that we're in where there's feuds or, you know, digital feuds between cis women and trans women about 
who owns body parts and experiences of womanhood, it keeps me wanting to dream again about how we continue to not just bridge gaps, but to like heal and mend hearts. And like in that, it excites me. Um, it really excites me. I'm excited to be alive and to be alive with brilliant folks like the co-authors of this of this book um, and other organizers like Asha and, and my team to be dreaming and scheming of strategies that keep us well and safe. Thank you so much, Tony Michelle. Kelly, I want to come to you. I, I want to like pull on this thread of storytelling with a question about policing. Uh, and you write that there's a myth that we need authority to protect us from our own chaotic impulses in the time of crisis. What are the types of experiences people need to have to recognize that this is a myth uh, and that there is another possible truth that they can embrace? Well, for one thing, I think people need to experience the power of mutual aid. They need to see and to know that we do have the power to save one another in many instances and that we can create safety and forge new ways of living together. When people experience that kind of care and protection and community building and they realize the contrast between that and what mechanisms like policing offer, we are changed by that, um, just as profound failures on the part of the state can shape our politics. Experiences of care and collectivity also reshape our politics. So I think people need to experience the power of solidarity in order to understand that other people who we've been coached to fear are actually our best hope. I also think that experiencing the utter uselessness of police is another way in which people unfortunately come to understand some of the myths around authority and what it does for us. Because a common refrain among people who critique abolition is, what are you going to do when someone attacks you or steals your car or does whatever terrible thing to you? And I, I get so annoyed with this question, because one, you know, of course, bad things happen to abolitionists. We have these experiences and who helps us? Obviously not the state. It is other people in our communities who come to our aid. But um, I got so annoyed with this question once on Twitter that I asked people in response, um, when those things have happened to you, what did the police do? Like, write it down? Because 99% of the time, that's the best case, that they simply write down the complaint and forget about it without causing future further harm. And a lot of people find that beyond failing to help in any way, the police will actually re-victimize people in various ways. And um, as a lot of people who responded to that tweet illustrated, uh, the idea that police protect us or bring order amid crisis, it doesn't come from reality because that narrative just isn't alive in the world. Um, you may find the occasional feel-good story, and every once in a while one of those stories may be legit, but cops in general are not rescuers or good deed doers. That's just not the reality of policing. Those ideas come from storytelling, right? Um, they come from propaganda in the form of TV shows, movies, and journalists who are basically stenographers for the cops. So much of the esteem people have for them comes from storytelling rather than anything real. So we also need storytelling that counters those lies. And we need to show people what's real and what's actually possible. Uh, I'm going to follow up on that question uh, with a question to both Tony Michelle and to Asha. And I'll start with you, Asha. Another important idea in the book is the, uh, about the power of listening and building bonds of trust in order to meet people where they're at. How does this look in your work? You know, as we just heard from Kelly, you know, we have a whole industry that's trying to seed in people's mind uh, the belief that you know there are only certain ways to be safe, only certain ways um, to feel in community, the only certain ways to feel powerful. And I wonder how you engage folks on the journey of social change. Oh, wow. that's a great question. 
Uh, that's a question that I'm still learning and processing myself because like in my organizing experience, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've, uh, you know, it's, it's always going to be conflict that you have to resolve with your people. And in my experiences, I see that what worked is like, uh, generally, I feel like holding circles can really help uh, process conflict and not like uh, taking what's said like from social media, like just take it to the source and addressing whatever is happening, especially if it's like very serious. Um, and I think uh, engaging people is pretty fun. Like you could say, hey, come to this meeting. We're going to play some games after or hey, come to this meeting. It's going to be an art build. And um, for me, that always works. I'll come to an art build. I'll come to cute little events. But it also charges my mind politically um, where it becomes like a learning atmosphere. And sometimes like in these organizing spaces is not, you know, just constant reading and analyzing. It's community building, which is so, so essential. Like um, one of my best organizing experiences is of course, No Cop Academy campaign. And that was like some of the best relationship building and organizing that I've ever experienced. And to this day, because of those relations, we were able to uh, grow out kind of like a tree and shoot other campaigns like Cops Out CPS. So I think you got to be really intentional, like don't use people, like don't use people's bodies like as a show front, like it's use youth, for example, use black youth um, for a photo op, but then like throw them aside when they're facing houselessness or facing violence, like don't abandon the people that uh, you actually want to engage in these campaigns. But yeah. Thanks, Asha. Tony, Michelle, I wonder for you, uh, how does this practice show up in your work? Yeah, um, I love Asha's statement so much. Um, and I think for for me, um, it shows up in different ways. Um, it shows up in the way that we move through our membership and support our people through our mutual aid project at SNAPCO called the Taking Care of Our Own Fund. And I do think that, you know, everyone is coming. We talk about survival. People are always coming up and walking up to like a new wave, right? A new like flow of water, a new moment in their life and listening is like the foundation of building that relationship is literally, it's literally the embodiment of the question is literally just being present and meeting them there and just offering energy and support and an ear. Um, because the more folks, what I've learned with uh, case management or um, de-escalation tactics, um, with folks in our base that um, they have their own strategy. <laughs> and oftentimes they just need someone to help to listen and help them facilitate themselves through uh, the, the chaotic moment that they're inside of sometimes. So being as grounded and as present and, and being as true to myself, um, and I encourage that in our other leaders um, in our base and our other staff folks, um, the more that you're able to be yourself, the more and take your own breaths, the more that invites others to breathe deeper um, and to be present more. Um, so that's how it looks. I also want to kind of talk in the context of um, some of the issues that are happening here in Atlanta. Um, the world is watching as we are in a fight to stop Cop City, right? Um, and that is one of the... <laughs> It's a case study to be told how literally everyone in your city, uh, constituents in the city, in the greater Atlanta area, in this around the South, around the country and around the world is yelling, stop Cop City. Um, and the leaders of the city 
literally refuse to hear and to act and respond in the ways that would keep people safe based on the, their own strategies that they've created. And so, um, and for us, we've articulated that our safety relies on less police um, and more budgets put toward our safety and of course, community care. Um, and we're not seeing that. Um, and um, I, I just hope that, you know, our leaders here in Atlanta um, and as we are in the uh, fight to get the referendum um, moving on the ballot for November um, and getting all of the signatures that we need for the petition, um, I hope that people listen deeply and well with each other. Um, and take action to hold um, our leadership and government more accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing what uh, we do find money for and what we don't find money for. And Cop City is so par paradigmatic uh, of the things that uh, uh, our money, when our money is used against us, right? Uh, and um, I'm so glad that you are in Atlanta and that you are a part of this fight. Miriam, I'm going to go to you. Uh, you said that we've been taught to imagine that the alternative to policing is nothing, nothing less than brutal chaos. This is similar to the question uh, that I asked Kelly, but I'm curious from your perspective, uh, who does that myth benefit? Uh, and what are some of the alternatives, right? So like we we know that there's this entire industry and machine that is meant to plant a seed of fear inside of us. What are, uh, what are our different seeds uh, um, that we could be planting inside of people uh, beyond policing as a way that we stay safe? Thank you for that question. I hear that question a lot from people in general. And I do think that there's something really, I don't know, I've told this story before um, because I think it's really emblematic of the way that we have been um, conditioned on purpose to not just fear each other, but to fear ourselves um, and kind of think of like, that we ourselves cannot handle things um, uh, anymore. And to kind of colonize our ideas and colonize our imaginations um, in the process. Um, so I don't know how many people know this story of a man um, named uh, Peter Warner, who many years ago, um, he was really, really well known in Australia. Um, he died a couple years ago and he was like 90 years old. But he and a crew of people back in 1966 rescued a group of teenage boys who had been stranded on an island for more than a year. Um, and these boys um, basically went on a joyride. Um, they decided to skip school, go on a joyride. They were ages 13 to 16. They were part of a boarding school. They stole a boat, it's about 24 feet. And um, in a few hours into their trip, a wind broke and broke their sail and rudder. And they ended up being adrift on an ocean for like eight days. So they end up going and spotting an island, which is called Ata, which was about 100 miles south of um, Tonga Tapu, which was uh, the main island of Tonga, which had once been the home of about over 300 people. Um, but then in 1863, the basically a British slave trader kidnapped about 150 of these people. So the Tongan king decides to relocate the rest of the folks to another island where they could actually be better protected. But so the boys end up on this island that's deserted. They come at first, they're eating just like fish and coconuts and bird eggs. And three months later, they find the ruins of a previous village. Their fortunes improve. They end up finding a machete at some point find domesticated taro plants. They find a flock of chickens supposedly descended from the ones that had been left behind by the previous inhabitants. They managed to start a fire, which is really important. And they keep burning that fire for the rest of their stay. They make a settlement. They create thatched roof hut. They create a garden. They make their own badminton court open air gym. I mean, they're like, they're killing it. These are between 13 and 16 years old. Okay. These people are killing it on this island, right? One kid comes up and pulls debris from a boat and makes like a friggin' guitar. So they're now singing and having prayer on their island. Oh my goodness. Okay. They're establishing all these like rosters of duty. Like you do this, they take turns resting. 
gathering their food, watching for ships to be saved, right? When fights break out, the boys talk about how they tell each other, you go to the opposite end of the island until you cool off, and then you come back, right? One kid breaks his leg, the others make an actual splint and his leg heals perfectly. They go back in 20, they, he gets, so these, so these boys are rescued in 66 by this guy, Peter Warner. They're brought back to quote unquote civilization. And they, uh, the New York Times goes back and interviews one of these young boys in 2021. They're now old men. And he says, the, the, the man says at one point, when he's interviewed about his stay there, he says, when I think back to my like time on this island, I realized that I really learned a lot. But when I compare it to what I gained in school, it wasn't even close, right? I learned more on the island than I did at school because he says, I learned to trust myself, right? Okay, so I tell you this story about these teenage boys on this island of Atta because a few years before this actually happened in 54, a book comes out called Lord of the Flies. How many of you have heard of the book Lord of the Flies? Every single one of us, including Asha, who's like, what? How old are you, Asha? You know what I mean? Are you like 20 or something? Well, you're young. I, yeah, I'm now but 22. You heard of this book that came out in 1954, telling us that when you are stuck on an island, you're going to probably eat each other and cause havoc, right? That was a fictional story. But we didn't read the book about the young boy, right, on Atta, who got rescued in 1966 after spending almost a year on this island deserted with each other. Now, here's the point of that whole story, which is to say, for me, that why we don't hear those stories is because stories are powerful. And they can be both healing and transformative. But the stories we tell ourselves as a society can also be super limiting and damaging, right? Right? And to me, policing and prisons are stories that have been told and retold now over generations. But the fact is that there was a time that existed before we had police or prisons and before those things were ever imagined, let alone invented. So that means that we can actually pass down other stories if we want to about safety and well-being. We don't have to rely on death-making institutions being the story that we keep passing down to each other all the time, right? And to me, the modern stories we have of policing and prisons, they encompass all of our fears, all of our values, all of our desires. But for me, as an abolitionist organizer, part of my task is to tell a different story. And that story is one that challenges the current ones that say that these systems actually produce safety. I think, in fact, the presence of these, quote, prisons and police actually announces our insecurity and our unsafety. So our job is to show that to people on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the ways I do that is through a project that we started at Interrupting Criminalization called One Million Experiments. And it is looking at hyper-local examples of people creating community safety in a broad sense and well-being and wellness in their local areas and communities. You can go to one million, you can go to millionexperiments.com and you can go there and see dozens and dozens of examples of what I mean when I talk about community safety, what I see as the ways forward that are so myriad and disparate that we can't even begin to imagine what's going on. And the last thing I will say is if somebody wants to understand, the fact is most people don't call the police. Okay? That's the friggin' fact. When things go wrong in most of our lives, I want you all to think of how often in your life you've actually called the police. Anybody listening to this? The vast majority of you have never done so. And so what are you afraid of then? Just not having a number? If that's the case, we can find other ways, like call our neighbors, right? We can find different ways of relating and reacting and et cetera, et cetera. So I say all that to really just contextualize that all of this is a story too. And that therefore that means we can change that story and we can say something else. And there are other examples and they exist and you don't need to, there's no gotcha to me when people say this. And Kelly said this before, when somebody says, what will you do when the car, when the, somebody steals something from your car? Well, my people have stolen something. In fact, I've had my car stolen. And I'll tell you what happened. Nothing. The cops didn't do 
a thing. They didn't prevent the stealing and they certainly didn't get the car back. Okay. My house was broken into. We still, it has been how long? Uh, eight months. We still haven't gotten the friggin' mandatory police report from the, the police. So we can't even get our insurance because the insurance is tied to whether or not you have a police report from the damn cops. So let's, let's talk about how ridiculous that is. Right. And stop being like, you're gotcha to us. You're not gotcha to us. I'm not worried in that way. I'm not getting anything from this current system that is not constantly harming a lot of people and killing a lot of people who look just like me on a regular basis. Could we not do something better? We can't do better than this? Come on, y'all. We can do better. <laughs> so, no, the, I, uh, it's so funny. I wanna, I have a question for Kelly, but I wanna ask it of you. You know, like um, I have, uh, I really love my job. I really do so much uh, and have a gift of a job in that I could be my whole self so I can talk about being abolitionist. I can talk about and uh, be really clear about my commitment to uh, a left political vision uh, that's organized around our collective well-being and liberation. And a number of my peers don't have that gift. They have different boards, different, they're accountable in different ways to different people. And one of the things that I uh, encounter more than anything is uh, folks who are ready for reform, but not yet abolition and I feel like this story that you just shared Miriam is like a it's like a fast track it's like a bullet train onto this uh universe and I wonder like what uh I wonder how you bring people on the path how you invite people onto the bullet train and then I'll ask you the same question after Miriam Kelly Yes, I know Kelly has thoughts on this because my belief is that you don't convince anybody of anything because we don't do that. It's not a convincing factory. We are not evangelists. Do you know? My bottom line around this is to consistently put examples through my own examples, show the work that we are doing over and over again. And when people have questions being open to those questions, being open to people saying, I don't know what else to do and saying, okay, well, let's think together because that means that more of us coming together and thinking together, we have a better shot at coming to a better answer, at least for us in this moment, or we will be able to at least ask better questions that might get closer to better answers, right? So I think something that I notice sometimes is especially people who newly come upon a new way of thinking in the world, they become extremely, um, how should I call this, militant and trying to get everybody else to be who like, you need to come here to, and it's like, that's never how it works, particularly think about yourself. I, I say this to all the time to people. I'm like, their abolitionists are not born. We are made. We are made over and over again. And then we are remade. And that is through experiences, through looking at something and being like, this doesn't make sense. We got, There's got to be some other way to do this. Why are things happening in this way over and over again? I've, I've, I've turned to these systems. They've continuously failed. The reforms that we were promised are going to make a difference uh, 250 years ago still haven't done the difference. People are still dying in jails all over this country every single day. People are still on no air conditioning. People are in heat strokes in our prisons and jails. That's inhumane, right? That's inhumane. So we are constantly having to be exposed to things. And then the best part is once you're ready, if there's a soft place for you to land, right? That makes all the difference. If there are people there ready to take you with them and be like, hey, look over here. We're thinking about this too. Join us. If we can have radical hospitality in our movements, we don't judge somebody and be like, how long did it take you to get here? Boy, you should have figured this out a long time ago. What was wrong with you? Nobody wants to look like they have, everybody wants to save face. None of us want to be humiliated. None of us want to be told we're wrong and our beliefs are wrong. That's so harmful to us. 
right? People don't join in situations when you say you're wrong, everything about you is wrong. By the way, now join our group. Nobody's going to do that. And so that's part of my work is what we have to do with abolition is I think consistently show through our deeds and our work that we have opportunities to do things differently. And then welcome everybody who wants to be on that path alongside with us. But I don't want to argue with a bunch of people. You're not going to catch me on a stage debating the cops about abolition. Why? Because they are cops and they believe they should exist. And why am I there yelling at a cop saying you shouldn't? What kind of debate is that? <laughs> yeah. Kelly, I want to invite you in as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to name that um, most of the people that I have built with, um, at least in the beginning, uh, did not have the same politics as me. Um, most of the people that I've been in the streets with weren't abolitionists when I met them. Um, almost no one enters into active politics with fully formed radical views. Um, and, you know, like, again, like most of these folks that I've, I've been in direct actions with, that I've, um, that I've been in meetings with, they weren't abolitionists, at least not at first. I think people's politics um, evolve in the process of waging struggle, as Miriam was describing. I don't think we get to simply correct people's views and then welcome them aboard. It happens in the waging. And what's deeply important to me in those situations is what we can agree on and what we do have in common. I have told rooms full of people to whom my politics were a bit wonky or out there that while they may not agree with me about this or that, we have a whole lot more in common with each other than we do with the people who would destroy us. Um, as a jumping off point, we can support each other in shared struggle. We can learn from each other. And that's how substantive, substantive politics are formed, in my opinion. Our analysis changes based on experience. And I don't think it's any coincidence that a lot of people who were demanding that killer cops be jailed in 2014 were demanding the abolition of policing in 2020. That abolition, that that evolution happened in the waging and in the process of people making demands that either weren't met or that changed nothing upon being met. Um, we learn by doing and by seeing and by experiencing how the system works and our relationships and our solidarity are part of that process. Because if we are organizing well, people are not simply becoming disillusioned, but also latching onto and developing other ideas about how things could and should be. So to me, it's, it's not really a question of like making space for people who aren't fully on board with my politics, but of us all making space for difference and figuring out how to build upon the things we do agree about. And it's about forging the relationships that allow us to keep learning. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the planning uh, for our book talks, uh, there are a set of questions we go around. If, uh, and rarely does this happen, but I, I'm gonna take like the moderator's uh, privilege. Uh, we wanted to wrap with this quote that uh, by Desmond Tutu that says, the only way we can be free is together. And I wanted to ask each of you your final thoughts on this powerful idea. And I feel like you all have done the work throughout this conversation to demonstrate that it's through life-affirming institutions, systems, relationships that we are together and build the future that we want, that it's listening uh, that we have the future that we want. And so I'm actually gonna use this as a moment to thank you all uh, for being here. I can't uh, tell you, both how uh, energized and excited I am that we get to share this powerful book with uh, our beloved community here in the Puget Sound and across the country. I've learned so much from being in conversation with all of you, 
For our guests online, I want to thank you for being part of the Margaret Casey Foundation Book Club. As always, our events are free and available on our YouTube page. For information on our past and future events, please go check us out at caseygrants.org. On behalf of Margaret Casey Foundation and all of our staff who work hard to bring this book club to you, I want to thank you for joining us today, and I want to I hope that you have a great rest of your day.